Aporia magazine. What is it? What brought you to it in the first place? Bo Weingart on the show. <laughs> Hi, thank you. <laughs> was that was that the question? <laughs> yeah, I wanted to do one of those punchy intros that sometimes you see on programs. That was it was quite punchy. It took me by surprise. Um, Aporia magazine. What is it? We call ourselves the only sociobiology magazine in the world. That is a bold claim, and I, I haven't verified it. However, I can say <laughs> that we are a magazine that covers a lot of what I think are crucial but sort of taboo topics, and we try to do so in a responsible way. That is, we talk about human variation, um, some of the people that are more interested in eugenics, I'm not particularly interested in that. And I'm not an expert in that, so I won't discuss that aspect of our coverage. Um, but human variation, um, sex differences, quote unquote, wokeism. Uh, I should say, though, that we're not. I mean, certainly we have political views, each of the editors, you know, but. I don't think that that's a crucial part of our mission. We're open to well-argued pieces from any side of the political spectrum on these particular topics. Um, so that's what it is. Um, and I, I, I got to it. I guess my personal story is not terribly interesting, but um, my boss essentially asked me to come aboard <laughs> And I, I had a rapport with him and I believed in the mission. I, I thought, you know, this is important. I like to write about these things. I like to think about these things. We need to have more candid discussions about these things that are judicious, but, you know, open. And that's why I, I joined. And um, I've been, in, you know, impressed and delighted by our growth. Usually when things match your interest or passion or there's a group involved, then there's growth that comes from that. It's it's nice, though, you know, because sometimes you have interests or, um, you know, desires that are not not popular, which I mean, not that we're pop. I'm not we're not uh, talking about celebrity here, but we're talking about there's a real niche here and people seem to like what we're doing. So um, that's gratifying. In what you say or do, what are some of the things you are wanting to express? What are some of the themes you are wanting to express to the general public? Oh, that they can add into their repertoire. Broad the, question. The, the, that is a very. I, I'm not even sure I totally understand it, but I'm going to take a. I'm going to take a swing at it. So, um, well, I, you know. Probably to me, the most important value for a public intellectual to endorse and to promote and importantly to abide by is intellectual honesty. Intellectual honesty sounds easy and probably many people think, well, I'm a pretty intellectually honest person, not not me, but they think to themselves <laughs> um, and, you know, maybe they are. But I think it's quite difficult, especially in a time when we're very polarized and many institutions, mainstream institutions, academia, uh, the, the mainstream media, at least what some people call derisively the prestige media are quite progressive. And there are, uh, let's say, intense taboos surrounding some important topics. I think human variation is probably perhaps the most taboo topic. Um, so being intellectually honest is difficult because expressing your, your candid views about these topics, it's at, at minimum, it, it is a, a, a impediment to one's career in some situations like academia. I, I can say that my my academic career foundered pretty quickly because precisely because I was honest about what I thought about human variation. Nevertheless, I can, uh, as Noam Chomsky put it, I can l look at myself in the mirror in the morning and I can, I can feel good about being honest about my opinions. Now, importantly, I don't think this means somebody needs to be honest about everything. 
And I don't, I don't even think people, uh, suppose that you're um, a chemist. I don't think you have to go read like Charles Murray or something and opine about human variation. <laughs> I don't think that's the duty. I think the duty is to be honest about topics on which you are well informed and which you can bring some sort of edification to the public. And, um, and th that doesn't mean you have to obsess about it either. It just means you should be honest about it when the time arises or when there's an opportunity to be honest about it. So that that's what I think. That's my number one sort of value that a public intellectual should hold. That should be the lodestar of a public intellectual. Because being a public intellectual, and I'm not I'm not claiming any particular fame for myself. I'm just saying that's what I do. I mean, I write for a public, you know, for a magazine. I try to get people to read my articles, etc. Um, it's a great privilege. It, it it's awesome. You know, it's it's you get to read things that are interesting for your living. I, it's not a, a lucrative living, or at least mine mine is not <laughs> lucrative, but it keeps me alive. It puts food on my table. So I, I consider myself very lucky. And if there's like one principle that we should adhere to being so lucky, it is honesty about intellectual topics. After all, the world is full of political syncophants and myrmidons and people who truckle to those in power. So like, I think the 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 precise temptation public intellectuals who are so privileged should resist is being obsequious to those in power, right? Uh, and I think that that is what we do at Aporia as well. That's certainly what I do in my articles. I write about a wide range of topics, but a lot of them are about human variation. And I write honestly about it. And I, by honestly, I mean, my conclusions to the best of my fallible ability. Of course, I could be wrong, right, about anything I write about. That's why I always say, you know, if you think my article's wrong, write an article for us. I don't care if it disagrees with me. We'll publish it so long as it refrains from ad hominem attacks and it's not tendentious, right? Uh, but my point is, like, I, I, Aporia allows me to be intellectually honest and academia did not allow me to, obviously, <laughs> since my, my academic career was abortive. So that, that is the most important thing. Now, I, I should say, uh, for people who, who aren't public intellectuals or, you know, they, they have other jobs, maybe they're a lawyer, an accountant, whatever. Maybe intellectual honesty is not feasible. I understand that. I mean, we, we people specialize. So I'm just saying that I, I'm reserving that sort of austere moral principle solely for public intellectuals. And I would consider academics public intellectuals. They're getting taxpayer money to live uh, an enormously entertaining life of the mind. So they too should be honest. Now I sound didactic. I forgot what the question even was. I went on this harangue. <laughs> I hope I don't seem doer here. But I forgot. It was something about, um, yeah, well, this is something I think is important anyway, let me say. And if anybody ever hears me talk and they think, you know, that point about intellectual honesty really resonated with me. And I'm going to try to live up to that principle. That would make me feel good. That would be like a, a great accomplishment to uh, inculcate that value in a few people. S some kind of intellectual conformity is, is sort of part of human nature because people who were dissidents in, you know, uh, 20, 20,000 years ago, if you were in a group and you were like, you know what, you guys, these ideas are stupid. Uh, I'm going to try on my own. Uh, you probably didn't live very long, <laughs> right? Not only uh, would you irritate uh, your tribe members and perhaps they would m murder you uh, quite literally, but also you, if you if you tried to uh, live a solitary existence 20,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, uh, that was impossible. You literally couldn't live alone as a human. So I do think that that is definitely a part of human nature and tribalism is a part of human nature. I don't even think it's necessarily a bad uh, part of human nature. I, I, I don't know what the status of the discourse is these days, but 
seemed as though there was like a run from like 2013 to 2020, perhaps, um, during which many people uh, castigated tribalism. They thought it was like some great human failure and that we should transcend tribalism. Uh, I perhaps participated in this. I remember being a proud centrist at one time, you know, <laughs> which is fine. I don't have anything wrong, uh, you know, against. I'm not opposed to centrism per se. But I, d I don't I don't share that attitude. I think tribalism is perfectly natural and healthy. However, in science, I think we've worked hard to move away from tribalism because sci science I see as like a, a, a human-made institution. It obviously builds from some aspects of human nature. We're curious. We naturally want to know how things work, etc., but also it it suppresses other aspects of human nature. Um, and one of the aspects of human nature that it attempts to suppress is tribalism or, or sort of a, a blind allegiance to an idea or set of ideas, an ideology, as it were. Perhaps the same thing is true in uh, the domain Bezos knows best, namely market capitalism, right? It is market capitalism is this great human invention that actually rewards innovation to some degree. I mean, obviously most innovators are, they fail. I mean, that's how capitalism works. But some innovators, uh, e.g. Bezos, Steve Jobs, uh, not only do they succeed, they succeed <laughs> qu quite insanely, right? <laughs> they, um, they they win the a lottery ticket, as it were, in the market. And so original thinking in both science and market capitalism can be handsomely rewarded and it can be crucial to humans. You know, new ideas reshape our vision of the world or reshape our idea of, you know, computing or um, selling items. I, I mean, I think Amazon, I'm not, and I, I don't know much about the history of Amazon, but I believe it just started out as a, a place selling books, right? Which is amazing to think about now because it's almost like this omni corporation at this point. But yes, yeah, so human nature is tribalistic. People, uh, I think, naturally mm, disdain dissidents and, and unorthodox opinions and ideas. I don't think there's anything bad about that. I think you know, I, I would recommend intellectual honesty, but even there, I would say, I, I, I do think you should be cognizant of people's sensitivities and sensibilities, and you shouldn't strive to offend them gratuitously. So for example, if, you know, I talk about human variation, I, I understand that that's an incendiary topic and that it can be quite shocking and offensive to people. And therefore I attempt to use quite circumspect record rhetoric because of that. And I, I think that's fine. I think people should expect you to be a little bit more cautious about those things. So yes, it's a part of human nature. It's something I think we should respect and, un and understand, but it can be in these certain domains, certain institutions, uh, market capitalism. So the business world, uh, the world of science, we do attempt to transcend it a bit and to suppress uh, natural tribalism and natural, I think perhaps even more important um, to Bezos's quote is, at least in science, I'm not, as, I'm not as sure if this is germane to business, but in science, I think moralizing opinions is really the, the, the treacherous thing, the natural human propensity that can lead to a dis distortion of, of um, science because we care a lot about human nature and our understanding of human nature is important to us, not just for our own identity, but for our moral sense of the world. And therefore, we, if somebody makes an empirical claim, an empirical statement, let's take a, a less controversial, but somewhat controversial one, there are sex differences in say overall mathematical ability. Now that's an empirical claim. We, we, well, we should treat that as a hypothesis. Okay, let's look at the evidence for this. What makes you make that claim? Uh, do you have any theoretical reasoning here? Are you just shooting from the hip, <laughs> etc.? 
But people hear that and they turn it into a moral claim immediately. They, they seem to translate that into, oh, this person's asserting that men are better than women. And that's when it becomes a problem, right? So I, I, I think that tendency to moralize opinions, which again is probably, I'd have to think about this more. I don't, I don't want to opine too strongly about it, but it probably makes sense in your local community and in everyday uh, life, but it, it is actually harmful to the scientific enterprise. This is a valid point. If there's something that has like a logical basis to it, and then you add this other element on top of it, that this is not good or that's bad, or how could you say that you're taking away from the base of just the facts right. underneath it to make it what it is? Right. What are your, in, on the topic of human variation, what are some important concepts under that basis that you would present? That are controversial, if you will? Yeah. <sighs> um. There are uh, uh, many interesting ones, uh, but because a person has only so much what I have called controversy capital, <laughs> and I spend almost all of mine on human variation, I don't think about the other ones so much, but I can forward some examples. So sex differences, it's less controversial, it's less taboo, uh, but it's still enough to to... <laughs> <laughs> to cause definite anger and tendentious and sententious responses and ad hominem attacks, etc. And it's something, it's a topic about which uh, people who don't have tenure are, are very cautious about. Not having tenure means you can get fired. It's much more easy to, to get fired. Um, other examples would be now, I think the transgender issue is quite controversial and even making empirical claims instead of this, like you were talking about this on top layer, even the underlying layer where you just attempt to understand the phenomenon, it becomes moralized. And like homosexuality is another one of these things where it's, it's really difficult even to analyze it empirically because if you arrive at the wrong conclusion, people will be apoplectic about it, right? And in, trans, in, in, in the transgender uh, topic, I know, for example, I'm not an expert on this, certainly, but people have forwarded the autogynophilia hypothesis, which is that at least some uh, subset of transgender individuals have a, it's a sort of sexual drive to see themselves as men, to see themselves as women. I won't get into more of the detail because, you know, I'm not it's I'm not an expert on the topic, certainly. But that's a very controversial thesis. And people who have forwarded it, such as um, Michael J. Bailey, have been excoriated quite unfairly, in my opinion. So that that's an example. Really, I think in today's environment, anything that touches upon what I would call perceived victims groups, right? These these protected groups, uh, racial minorities, sexual minorities, religious minorities, you get the theme here, minorities, <laughs> um, that th they've become this sacred, uh, th this protected groups, perhaps with some reason. I mean, we could get into that. That's complicated. But it, it becomes excessive and, and there, there's uh, taboos develop around saying anything that could be perceived as negative about them, even if it's simply an empirical claim. Uh, but again, just to be clear, I mean, I have wasted most of my controversy on one particular topic. So that's, that's what I feel more comfortable with. And I, I know, I understand the taboos about that topic better and how they work. Makes sense. Right. That's a specific topic. I see it on some different programs. Uh, the comparison between men and women. And on the bigger theme, if there isn't room to clearly cover certain details, doesn't that make us weaker as a whole? Because then, like, this is untouchable. No, that can't be done. No, how could you even consider that thing? Right. That out. You're just removing all the pieces such that you're left in this little circle of, you can be in this little circle. 
Yeah, well, that would be my feeling about it, especially when we're talking again about science and like understanding humans scientifically. It, it, it makes the science weaker, by the way, right? Because what you're saying is if you can't um, address and attempt to grapple with any kind of alternative hypothesis to the one that I mean, you're making it a small circle, right? This, this is the accepted opinion here. And not only will we not adjust this opinion, but we won't even hear alternatives. If you forward an alternative, we will denigrate you. We will calumny you. We will end your career, perhaps, right? That that makes science weaker. I, I'm not, I, I mean, I understand, like, you're not going to teach some things in a college. Like, you're not going to teach creationism. People always go to this example. Oh, well, you know, we don't allow creationism. Okay, yes, we don't. But people do debate creationists. Richard Dawkins has debated a creationist or multiple creationists, I believe. So we do actually still grapple with that theory about the, the rise of life. Uh, similarly, we should grapple with other theories, theories about the causes of human variations, theories about sex differences. And if the, the, the accepted scientific uh, wisdom, if you will, is this very small circumscribed circle, this is the only accepted opinion, and we won't even, we won't even address these other opinions, that makes that opinion weak. And often what you find is it's in fact so weak. And, and I would say in many cases, so obviously incorrect that the only way it can survive is precisely by morally bullying anybody who forwards an opposing view, right? Because generally, if you feel comfortable about your theory, you think this is a good theory, this has a lot of evidence, you're eager to debate other people. You're like, yeah, <laughs> right? Let's get it on. Let's let's go see how these theories battle against each other. That should be fun. Maybe I'll learn something. Maybe you'll learn something. We'll see what happens. But these theories are so weak and paltry and obviously flawed that they simply can't stand the evidence. So they have to, instead of addressing the evidence, they just name call the people who forwarded the evidence. And that, I think, is unfortunately, and it definitely makes the science weaker. It also causes, I don't know what the cost of this is, but I've thought about it a lot. It causes this kind of, I don't know if you would call it hypocrisy, but it causes this dual world in which people pretend to believe something publicly but privately they believe something else, right? I saw this all the time in academia and there's just, there's something kind of perverse about that, right? You know, we're not talking about like, oh, okay, you should keep your view that like so-and-so is not in a particularly attractive person in private. Yeah, of course we understand. We're talking about serious intellectual topics though, that these people lie about. And then privately you can have the honest conversation I just think there's something quite unfortunate about that in, in academia, especially in science, right? In science, we should be adults, we should be grown-ups, and we should be able to handle empirical theses and 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 theories uh, <laughs> with mature aplomb, let us say, and let the chips fall where they may, as the saying goes. I am on this point quite a bit when I see the oppositional nature that you're describing it does seem off and i have an yeah. talk or talk that i'm putting up with rob henderson you like mm -hmm. you know, rob yes i do beliefs yeah and how it's like presented one way and then there's an alternative under and going back to what you were saying earlier with the viewpoints for me it's always bugged me that i care less actually about a variety of the topics that are of concern but the the underneath factor i can feel like we're going to lose because we're doing it wrong. So mm -hmm. regardless of the discussion happening, we're going right. to come out losing in the bigger picture. Do you feel something like that underneath when you hear those kinds of discussions? Well, yes. I, I mean, I just, I think any time, any time an institution that is putatively dedicated to the truth I think the media we would put in this category as well, right? So academia and the media, let's put those two in this category. 
uh, of institutions that are supposedly dedicated to the truth, any time they become enamored of sacred values and they start upholding the sacred values, this what you called this small circle, right? I like this. It's the small circle of this is what we'll accept. Anytime that, yes, anytime that is defended with, with vigor and, and hostility uh, against other views, yes, we, the institutions ultimately lose because not only do they not achieve their stated goal, namely the truth, but also they alienate and rankle other people. So I think, for example, I don't know what you think about this, but the academia's reputation is absolutely, you know, in, in tatters. And it's been, it, it, I mean, it became fashionable with good reason, I would say, for Republicans to bash college and, and uh, university education because they saw it as uh, leftist propaganda. Now, I don't know if that maybe look, politicians are going to be politicians. They're going to score points when they can. So I'm not saying that the, the attack is 100 percent accurate. I'm saying it's reasonable that a lot of people feel alienated from these institutions and when these institutions are only protecting their small uh, perspective and it becomes clear to most of the population that they will not allow free debate, which is their own stated value, by the way. It's not as if we're imposing this on them. <laughs> like, I remember, you know, all through academia, professors were quite proud of their, you know, uh, steadfast dedication to free speech. So, so this is a value these institutions promote quite loudly. And when people see that, in fact, they are not committed to that and that they are just uh, politically biased actors, they, they become frustrated with that, uh, angry, and they turn on the institution. And, and that also means we all lose because obviously, uh, in principle, higher education is awesome. Like, of course, we want to educate people and teach them critical thinking, expose them to multiple perspectives, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes, I, I think that's absolutely right. It's it's true for the media as well. I mean, I, 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 I don't know if we had survey data all the way back to the 1800s, you know, like 1810. And I, I, I've read, by the way, I mean, some... The election in the United States, uh, the 18, 1800 election between Adams and Jefferson was famously acrimonious. And I've read some of the uh, papers at the time. And for people who think rhetoric today is out of control, rhetoric back then was also out of control. This is not a novelty, right? Nevertheless, I, I think attitudes toward the media are about at their nadir right now. Like, prestige media is is a term of derision and we do i think we all lose when people completely lose trust in media and just bash it and they can dismiss anything the media says as you know um what it, what is uh trump's um oh, what is trump's like phrase his famous phrase uh, make a miss misinformation whatever I, I for some reason the the term he used <laughs> is, is escaping me but like you can just dismiss anything that's reported from the media by saying yeah of course it's the prestige media they're biased and they're liars and they aren't always sometimes they do tell the truth and it's important to have institutions that we can trust to a degree of course be skeptical but you you can trust to a degree so yes i do i think that in fact, quite strongly that that we lose from the, the sort of degradation of those institutions. The institutions have definitely, it's not the same 100% as it was, let's say 20 years ago, 25 years ago. The numbers are so different as far as attendees. Yes. Yeah. The seriousness of the yes. category. Okay, but here's the out. thing. Mm -hmm. Is it our men? Okay, here's the thing, Armin. I, I here's a question: Have you seen the film Network by any chance? So Network is a '70s Sidney Lumet film that's a scathing satire of the news, 
And I rewatched this yesterday and I was thinking, the amazing thing about this is the contempt for the news they had in the 70s is pretty similar to the contempt we have now. I think it's worse now. But the point being that we look to the 70s as the glory days. Oh man, you remember the 60s and the 70s? I guess the 70s is post Watergate, so it's getting worse. But like, <laughs> you know, we think it's so bad now, but then you go to the 70s and there's this absolutely devastating satire of the news, whereas it's just <laughs> everything we would say about the news today, that film says. So I just thought that was interesting. So I suppose that puts it in context uh, that it's always important, even though I agree with you that it has become, it's, it's noticeably worse now. It's been bad for a long time. And part of me just wonders, it, the thing I was thinking about is, is capital, I love market capitalism. I, I mean, obviously it has some problems, but by and large, I'm a huge fan of it. But perhaps that's just a bad way of providing news to people, <laughs> you know, because one of the things they, the, the, the satire in this movie is this anchor goes insane and he threatens, he says he's going to commit suicide. So he goes on live. He says he's going to commit suicide next week. And you would think, OK, that pull him off of the air. This is terrible for him. Let's get him help. But one of the ruthless women in the corporations, and there's an other guys too, but it's the Faye Dunaway character, is basically like, this could be a ratings bonanza. This could be great for us if we just keep this guy on. <laughs> and it's all about how can we make more money? What are our ratings? And that's the only thing they care about. Nobody's like, you know what? We should cover stuff that matters. <laughs> So there's kind of this just built-in feature of media in a capitalist system that is odd, which is uh, you're trying to make profit. And ultimately, what you care about, of course, is numbers. You don't care about, oh, is this the most important issue? We'll put it on the front page. Now. No, it's, is this the issue that will grab attention, hold attention, and sell papers, or now you know generate clicks, of course. So I don't want to get too... <laughs> I don't want to get too didactic about that because obviously, uh, you know, look, like, is it any better if you have the government running the news? Probably not, of course. But I just think there are these flaws and, and the news has been ridiculed for a long time for good reason, probably. Right. You bring up a good point here to try to look more clearly at the current decade versus past decades, even if it seems that the current decade is more of something mm -hmm. we haven't changed so much in our minds over the past right. century. Right. I, that's always good to keep in mind, by the way. <laughs> like any, any time you're like, I, I think about this when I read as, as sometimes I'll read like, um, you know, letters from, well, even like Marcus Aurelius or something, but you, you read letters from people thousands of years ago and they're basically the same. They have, you know, people <laughs> like, People 2,500 years ago, I know Aurelius wasn't quite 2,500 years ago, but I'm just saying like 2,500 years ago, smart people were railing against the next generation, right? This is, oh, kids these days, 2,500 years ago. <laughs> Why? Because our brains are the same or more or less, right? So yeah, I think that's, it's very worth keeping in mind that human nature has not changed that much in the past, say, 3,000 years, maybe a little bit, not much. So we, we, when we think about, okay, this problem, it seems that um, these forces are exacerbating this problem. I think that's fair to, to suspect, but this problem's brand new or society's falling to pieces, that's probably not true. And people have always thought that, right? <laughs> A continuous theme running through writings all the way back to ancient Greece is society is falling apart kids these days, right? And I I know I participate in dooms, doomsdayerism, especially about AI, and I'm maybe I'm just biased too, but I at least I recognize my bias, I suppose. A few good points here. One of them is that uh, AI, maybe we'll come back to that, how it's different. And then earlier impact versus income, an important concept, because if you're just thinking numbers, then... How focused are you on 
what's the end result and then also globally you could before just kind of send it over there but now over there is everywhere so there's no you can send things there anymore and then on the point of like the way it's dropping off there was the all-star game recently and nobody played hard because it doesn't really matter for the yeah, yes. year and everybody <laughs> commented how they'd never do this 20 years ago because they'd still compete yes. so there is a level of like we don't compete heavily unless it matches these priorities we've been given in life let's say capitalistically or based on the people around us and the other things we completely disregard and then i wanted to connect that to are we one by one tossing away each part of presentational humanity until we get to you know computers that do everything we need to do are we just kind of yes the illusion <laughs> we've been keeping up for a long time so let's many interesting points there so let's go to the MBA one first because I'm actually I was I was utterly uh, fascinated by this. So I must confess that I I just don't have time because I am interested in so many things that I I do not allow myself to watch sports. However, I look at the box scores every morning. It's the first thing I do when I wake up. Literally, the first thing I do is box scores. Right? What happened yesterday in sports? And so I'm familiar with the players in the advanced analytics, et cetera. That's what I find interesting. And I looked at the all-star score and I was like, what happened? It was like 211 to 187 or something. Now, to keep this in context for your listeners, an NBA game, now NBA is higher scoring now than it used to be, but an NBA game, you know, if you if you saw like 125 to 110, you'd be like, yeah, it's kind of a high scoring game or something, right? So this is almost twice that. And what? how did this happen? Nobody played defense at all, right? Now you might think, well, if nobody's putting effort in, offense should cancel out. No, because defense is harder. It's not as rewarding. So that's where you see when, when players don't put effort in, it's you, it shows up on the defensive end. But here's the problem on that one. And I, I maybe I'm just taking this too literally, but I want to take that example to see if it, it tells us anything about other other domains of life. The problem is nobody cares about all-star games anymore. What people care about is the championship. And if you're a player... Is it rational to work indefatigably during an all-star game and to put your body in peril, right? <laughs> is, is that rational when nobody 20 years from now is going to say, you know, uh, Zion Williamson, I don't even know if he played, but like Zion Williamson, he never won a championship, but he was really good in the all-star game. <laughs> Right. So I think like, OK, that you have these incentives for players and the incentives are everything you do should be about the postseason and about winning a championship. And, you know, maybe in 1985 or even 1995, there was a, a bit more like internal NBA pride in playing your ass off in the NBA. Like, can you imagine Michael Jordan, this guy who. If you said to Michael Jordan, let's play a friendly game of ping pong, he, he would try to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he would try to obliterate you, right? So like that kind of person, he's just going to do that. But most players are like more rational in some sense. And they're like, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to work that hard in this game and, you know, risk an ACL tear, <laughs> uh, now, I don't know how that relates to other things in, in, in society, but it does show something. It shows the power of incentives. Um, and it shows the example of Michael Jordan also shows the importance of personality, though, because I think Jordan is just that's the kind of person if he's on your team, I'll bet if he's on your all star team, you better work. <laughs> right? He's not going to let you take the all star game off. Um yeah, so that's interesting. We can come back to that if you have anything else on there. I wanted to hit AI, though. <laughs> so I'm a very pessimistic person about AI, and I've seen recently this like this video technology, which some people are saying, like, this is the chat GTP4, like, video. You know, this is the, 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 the revolution, if you will, like, where people are like, whoa, I didn't know it could do that. 
I find it all incredibly depressing, I must say, because I do think this is different. And I know I was just sort of urging skepticism about those claims. But on this one, you can kind of see that AI is going to do everything intellectuals, directors, artists like us. Yeah, people who we we worked hard to build up cognitive capital. We read a lot of books, et cetera, et cetera. We do interviews or I just think, think of like a 20 year old director, you know, it's like in 10 years, it's yeah, exactly. Those, those quaint things called books <laughs> that we spend hours reading a day. Right. Uh, you know, chat GPT four is not quite there. You know, you can kind of mess around with it and you're like, okay, I can still write better than chat GPT four. P4 by five or six, it's just going to destroy me. Not only is it going to destroy anybody, it'll just be way better. You'll be able to say, Hey, I really like Thomas Mann. Can you write this essay in the style of Thomas Mann? And it will do an impeccable imitation of Thomas Mann, right? Which is to me horrifying. So you can see in chess, we have an interesting contrast because in chess, the computers are vastly better than any of the players. Now the best player in the world, uh, you, you know, you, unanimous best player is Magnus Carlsen. Magnus Carlsen, I, I, my understanding, and I haven't played one of these things, so I don't know this, but I'm pretty sure an app that you can get on your iPhone today would whoop Magnus Carlsen, and certainly any of the supercomputers they use would destroy him. Not only would it destroy him, it could give up a pawn, probably two pawns to him, like literally start the game a pawn or two behind and still win. Now, why do we still watch chess then when we can just fire up a computer and be like, this is better? Well, in chess, we have a way to detect cheating. Now, it I don't know if you pay attention to chess because there have been a lot of cheating controversies. But in principle, at least, we can have people playing in a room. It can happen live. We can have cameras all around. We can test them very, you know, assiduously for any technology they might have smuggled in. So we get the sense that we're watching a live performance that's honest, no cheating. And that's still exhilarating to us. Problem is, with writing, you can't do that. How, 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 if we have a chat GTP5, or six, let's say it's six, that's like the one that can do everything. How are we gonna trust novels, right? Somebody says, I wrote this novel. We look at the prose and we're like, this prose is better than Nabokov and uh, you know James Joyce put together. No way a human could have written this. Suppose the human did, how do we know? How, we, we won't be able to determine cheaters from the real thing, and that will destroy the value of the real thing. And not just for book writing, for all kinds of things. You know, I think about AI girlfriends, AI boyfriends, AI husbands, AI, I, I don't know, the whole thing. <laughs> the whole thing is quite disturbing to me. Not even to mention what's called the alignment problem, like the issue of like, hey, might you get some kind of quasi-autonomous AI that just sees humans as a plague and wants to get rid of us? <laughs> can, yeah, it's, okay, right, excellent. <laughs> yes, yes, can we? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so this this is all a great, a great source of distress for me, for me I must say. So I, I actually honestly try not to pay uh, so much attention. I should actually read more about AI. Like you're, that book might just terrify me. Like I watch Terminator and I'm like, Terminator is actually like, it's, it's remarkably plausible, some version of it, obviously not like the exact aesthetics that we get in Terminator one or two, but some, or time travel. Yeah, exactly. Liquid Terminator is probably not coming anytime soon. But the scenario of Skynet becoming quote unquote sentient and then trying to destroy humans, apparent, I, I mean, again, I'm not an expert on this. I don't want to declare this with too much certainty, but I, there are people who are experts on the topic who are certainly alarmed by this, let us say, right? It's true. 
in the category the reason I don't have this stress maybe I have you stress I don't know the positive kind but <laughs> or maybe not stress but right because I have looked at most of what humanity has done for a long time as like illusionary or it's like formalities or falsities on top of the actual person mostly is what we see okay so in my view those are getting sent out as we get towards exactly the like person wants dopamine there or this thing here this thing here. we're getting to exactly where the people were originally wanting to be at their base core yeah so one by one as we remove these things that we're like oh no i was comfortable with that i was really comfortable with that yeah but this was like made up and it keeps it's always annoyed me so i'm kind of glad about these so you you think we're 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 almost like stripping away falsehoods and getting to like some co- sort of like the primitive true human unit of desire as it were. Okay. Yeah. But but my 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 issue with that this is like a I I I could somebody could write a book on this itself. But I I have this thesis that optimal efficiency is actually usually bad. Like like these layers that you're talking about as being illusory, I, I'm not sure that those aren't the most important things in life. <laughs> and that peeling those away and getting to this immediate, I just, uh, you, know, you know, this immediate feed. Take this for an example. S- suppose that you have a live stream television show and everybody's providing input about what they like the most. It's it's like, suppose it's in this AI loop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Tubes are shot into your brain, which is providing immediate feedback. I'm not actually sure that that would be the best way to create a show because in fact, what we want immediately, this immediate core of desire, if you will, probably isn't in our long-term interest or quite often it's not in our long-term interest. And therefore we actually, it's actually good that we can't satisfy those desires immediately. And I fear that when, if we can, we will just be plagued by ennui and a sense of pervasive meaninglessness. Like, What's my life? It's just the next dopamine shot. <laughs> This is true, and it's a nice addendum you're adding there. I'm thinking of, yes, desire, but also like direct feelings of dislike or any of the true features Mm -hmm. usually covered up by niceties or formalities. But that's true. If we do get to just an immediate response item with no delayed gratification, then we do kill off we wouldn't have a building. There would never we'd never get to building a building because Exactly by the time you start the first step, I'm done. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, that. so I think about like I, I'm fascinated. I don't. Are you familiar with Alex Honhold? He's a a free no. solo climber. It means he he climbs these intimidating. I may have been told about him. What's that? I may have been told about him recently okay. when I was doing my first rock climbing. Thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So he's like a rock star in the free solo world. Uh, I. I'm probably the worst cl- climber in the history of humans or right there about. Therefore, it fascinates me because I don't understand it. I can't do it. But he's interesting because he does these free solo climbs, you know, 3,000, 4,000 feet, whatever. And I just think like, okay, the whole point of that free solo is it's really hard. Mm-hmm. It's like climbing Everest or yeah, exactly. Really? That's exactly. <laughs> Although that's him in 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 a much safer environment inside. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but you think like, okay, what's the point of climbing Everest, right? I mean, it's like it, it sounds absolutely torturous. Like I watched the documentary Maru about climbing the the Maru this specific mountain, and it just looks terrifying, terrifying, and incredibly uncomfortable. It's cold miserable you're eating terrible food etc but the whole point is to suffer because it makes the achievement more gratifying now I, that's what i worry about if you if you get rid of the suffering and the, the the sort of torture that you have to go through to achieve something and you just get the dopamine shot immediately it becomes utterly meaningless that that's I what i worry in. about right i want to add in what i was referring to that main well dopamine was a big part of it too but also including 
the suffering. I'm more talking about the layers on top of joy and or suffering and okay. or difficulty that you don't see them in people and there's a facade or a mask or a presentation or keep things going kind I of I see. Energy. I see. But it is true you're saying too. We don't want to just be in one category. Right. Okay, anymore. I got you though. You're you're not mm -hmm. you're not saying we should get rid of all of these you know, you know, the the suffering that makes the goal more gratifying. You're you're not saying we should it just be, be like um, uh, you know, I I <laughs> my references may be lost on you. Have you seen Wally? I somebody told me about it recently because okay. that's what I was yeah. <laughs> Because in that, story because like, of what I was saying. the future and they're in the they everybody just has these hover chairs. They don't they don't even walk, so they're all uh, grossly obese, and they're just I I don't remember if they're drinking like Slurpees or something. <laughs> this is the world I picture where everybody's just satisfying their immediate impulses without any suffering or without any obstacles to overcome. Yeah, that one right there is no good because that was the whole point. When I look at the people's activity or moods, you can't have up without a down. Yes. The whole point of men and women was each one's specialization. So there was the mm -hmm. point that you have different, they complement. When you start to just mush everything together, now you just end the whole point of, we wouldn't have been two types of people if we didn't have some sort of specialization. We would have right. just stayed one. Or T totally one. agree with that. Totally agree with that. Yes. It's an interesting concept there. It's a funny one. There's a lot of the amount of videos I can think of that come up with just taking each of these kind of controversies, but they're not controversies. They're just things. And then 500 episodes of people arguing on that is a lot <laughs> yes. because I think there's something yes that's more like a simple level of fun to it. And or the viewers can be like, oh. There's something I can pin down. But if you just point out something like an encyclopedia, then the viewer is thinking this is not as pinging as that thing over there. Those people, there's punchy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You're probably right about it. I mean, because the encyclopedia is a good example, which is like, I guess I was weird and I did enjoy reading encyclopedias. But I will, I will confess that for most people, that is not the best way to consume information, right? And in fact... Not, not only is it like probably dreadfully boring, it, it, you also forget it so quickly because you're not putting it in this richer network of ideas. That's a good point. And that makes me think of the way that ideas are spread. Let's say it starts with, let's say there's a research paper from four very focused people that put in a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. That's a very small group. Yeah. And to go out further, there might be uh, someone who summarizes some of the research but needs some advanced knowledge that goes right. out to some people who want to do that then a book form maybe from an extended with some story then maybe a movie that connects with that that also has a love story then there's like a music <laughs> yes. that connects off of it and they <laughs> mention it in the chorus there's like right 94 different ways it branches out to each kind of person that can take it in that way yeah and there's an intra in, in philosophy there's this interesting idea of uh, uh s s like um I would even, I, I'm extrapolating a little bit, but like basically the idea that the meaning of words is like out in the world somewhere. And that, that sounds kind of like mystical at first, but like not really, because what you just said is what happened. So like my understanding of a beech tree, let us say, or of an armadillo is pretty limited. Like I have some idea of what an armadillo is. I could tell you about it. What I do is I say armadillo. I have this concept. And I know there are other people who know more about it. That would be the four people who would sit down and write this article about armadillo reproduction or whatever. Now, by the time I get the information about the armadillo, it's coming three sources and a, a nature documentary, right? <laughs> With a little jingle. <laughs> so there, there is this sense that like a lot of our knowledge is a kind of implicit knowledge that there are other people who know more than we do about this and we're deferring to them. So when we're talking about what you and I might talk about an elm tree or something, we don't actually, unless you surprise me and you know, all you're a botanist or something. <laughs> like, <laughs> Let me tell you all about elm, elm trees and my right. expertise. There. <laughs> we're, we're using this concept and we're, we're like the, the people again, 94, 94, nodes down 
who just hear about it and we, maybe we see one every once in a while. So I, I think that's interesting the way you put that and just thinking about what that means for like our understanding of the world and anything that we do, how how many filters it goes through before it gets to a lot of other people. This is true. I like the nodes. Right yeah, nodes. That, that's probably a yeah. better way than filters even perhaps. The you, that you described. I'm, thinking, I'm getting it from yours. Oh, that's yeah. Good. No, no, I know. But I, I sort of ruined mine by calling it a filter after that, which I'm not sure. Yeah. That's funny. On an alternate concept, but that you have spoken about and that I always conveniently have books about things. So... Robert Sapolsky. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. In his book, Determined. Yes. The wonderful topic of how much of what we do is our choice versus this is oh, already gosh. a step by step to where <laughs> I am currently. And my hand was going to move here because of the moment before. Right. And, uh, and variables beforehand. Where do you stand on these features? What are your thoughts? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's fortuitous that you asked me about this because I happen to read. Sapolsky's book, which you just showed there. I read it about two weeks ago, and I must say I found it disappointing, although it was entertaining. So I think if you read it, or if you have read it, not attempting to belittle it, and if you haven't read it, you should read it, because it is entertaining, and it does present one particular perspective on this topic. What I would say is that so my view is that Sapolsky's understanding of what free will is is quite limited and i i would even say it's it's so superficial that it's almost not worth talking about because he has this view that if there is no like metaphysical self or what philosophers will sometimes sometimes call a causa sui that is to say a, a self-caused self or, or i'm sorry a, a, like a, a self-caused cause, <laughs> a, an effect without a cause or a cause that just happens to happen, right? Um, his view is essentially, because that doesn't exist, and indeed it's logically incoherent, there's no free will. You are determined, and not only is there no free will, not only are you determined, but also all of the concepts that flow from our notion of free will, praise, Blame, moral responsibility, punishment. We should eradicate those. Now, now he's enough of a, a, a pragmatist to understand that we, we won't eradicate those anytime soon. But he thinks ultimately we should. He even says, I, I, I won't get the quote exactly correct here, but he says, there is no justification for blame or praise. None, he says. Now, I think this is just a profound misunderstanding of what free will is. So I would say, I accept what I would call heuristic determinism. Now, that sounds perhaps pretentious or unnecessary to put this adjective on this. But what I mean by that is I don't want to get into the metaphysical question of determinism, which you and I could talk about privately for five hours and probably not come to agreement about it. <laughs> and it's fun but it's not something that's practical when we're talking about these things. So what I would say is heuristic determinism is just the, the perspective, the view that we should act as if causes, uh, that uh, effects have causes. Events are always caused. So we just assume that. If, if we see a car accident, we think we can explain it through a series of causes. If we see a tree fall, same thing. Similarly, if we see somebody get a drink of water, we probably wouldn't say it's an unaccountable act of free will. Rather, we would say must be the person's thirsty or perhaps she read a book that said you should drink a gallon of water a day. So she's trying to get water, etc. Whatever. We think that there's a cause there. So I'm in, stay hydrated. Right. <laughs> And I'm, I'm an advocate of heuristic determinism. I think that's my perspective on the, the universe is I assume that effects have causes. I'm not saying that as a metaphysical thesis, though. But let's say we accept heuristic determinism, as Sapolsky does, too. He might even go further, but I can at least go this far with Sapolsky. That does not, in my view, vitiate free will. Free will can exist in a world in which people are determined. Not only that, I would actually go further and contend that free will only makes sense in a world in which 
people are determined because it's only that humans are predictable, uh, heuristically determined, metaphysically don't want to get into that, but you know what I mean? Like we can explain their behavior, but, but not only can we explain their behavior, but also they're predictable. And I think this is important because when we make moral judgments, we're making moral judgments about people and we're assuming that they did something for a reason. If, for example, uh, somebody killed somebody and you said to me, well, the reason Sally killed uh, Tina is because of free will, uncaused cause, spontaneous. We would be like, what? Can we blame her for an uncaused cause, right? Rather, what we would actually say is you would say, well, she killed her because she was jealous of her, right? And I'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. She was always a jealous person. We need to morally condemn what she did and make it clear to other people that that is not an appropriate response to jealousy, right? That would, I think, be a, a reasonable reaction to this. So my view is free will is, is really, the free will we want, the free will that we understand is really only sensible in a world in which we assume humans are determined and psychologically predictable. That's my view. Now, I, I, I will grant that this is not, I, I think this is called compatibilism. I don't want to get too much into the, tech, uh, the, the, the terminology because it gets rather cumbersome. But uh, I, I think a lot of philosophers are compatibilists now, but I don't, I don't think it's the most popular view among, maybe not among neuroscientists who seem a little more... Um, enthusiastic about determinism and eradicating free will so this is true it's sort of like there's a base of determinism and then free will on top of that where decisions are made in the moment is the view that would be the combo <laughs> I, I would even, I, I'm not even sure I would put it exactly that way although I you know that's reasonable enough I guess what I would say is Moral agents can exist. Moral agents, I consider moral agents free agents, can exist in a world that's perfectly determined and predictable. And it's, in fact, only because we can predict each other's behavior and we can manipulate each other's behavior with uh, moral blame and praise and, and the threat of punishment that we have free will. That's that's why that's how we have free will. I don't know that I would say it's like supervening on this determinist base. I would almost say it is a very part of the essence of being a moral agent that you have free will. That doesn't mean that you're not that your behavior is uncaused. Of course it's caused. It might be caused because it might be caused by your worry of losing your moral reputation. Right? Might be well, yeah, she did this because she doesn't want to get scolded by people. Okay. That's still, in my view, free will, so long as she has uh, the capacity to reflect on the world and on social norms and adjust her behavior accordingly. I have to continue on that point because that's a good one. Or uh, switch to that one. Ostracization and reputation. Mm-hmm. Has it become much stronger in current time because of online connectivity to be ostracized uh, for having any sort of slightly alternative thought? Mm -hmm. And then is that separate from the actual world that people are in their communities and whatnot? Is it like two separate worlds? And is one of them way more likely to slash at someone that doesn't exactly go with the boat <laughs> yeah no that that that's an interesting question because i i, I this is going to be like one of those annoyingly paradoxical answers but but i think it's yes and no for both because what i mean by that is on twitter for example there there is a riotous diversity of people and so you could have very uh, unorthodox views and find a crowd for those views, right? 
And maybe you couldn't do that in your community. Like, I don't know where you live, but I live in a reasonably small community. I, I don't think there are many, like, fans of human variation, chess, and Stanley Kubrick around here other than me, right? <laughs> so I was like, I'm not going to find those people. On the other hand, online, on Twitter especially, you're almost just a disembodied opinion. People don't even know who you are. Like, probably if you know, if people are unfortunate enough to waste their time talking about me, all they would talk about is my opinions. They wouldn't talk about like, oh, hey, he likes this kind of food or, you know, he's, you know, he's warm if you talk to him about this or he's kind of weird about that. They don't talk about that. They talk about, did you see what he tweeted or that article or whatever? And because you're a disembodied opinion, it's really easy to hate you, right? If somebody disagrees with me, they might just hate me because they have no other like way to relate to me. And I think that makes the punishment for dissidents, if you will, or the punishment for opinions, let's just put it that way, more intense on Twitter in some ways, because that's all you're doing is judging people for opinions. That doesn't happen in my community. In my community, nobody knows what my opinions about these issues are. Nobody cares. They say hi to me. Do you want to use our pond for the boat or whatever? <laughs> you know, like, do you want to have a barbecue or whatever? So it's just like a, a totally different environment. And in that sense, my community or many people's communities, I would imagine, they're almost like less judgmental just because they don't know that about you and they don't care. Like that's not what's important to me when I go to the store is, I hope the cashier has the same views I have about free will, right? <laughs> so that I think is what makes Twitter odd and and perhaps like this kind of hostile world. Now, I also, in, in, in addition to that, and I think this compounds the problem, th there's this mass punishment that you get on Twitter where there are, I, I don't know how many Twitter users there are, but let's say millions of people who are active. If you make a, a minor blunder and you go viral for whatever reason, maybe a million people will talk about you and chastise you on Twitter. Whereas like in your community of 9,000 people, even if they were all mad at you, that's 9,000 people. On Twitter, it may be a million. So it's like, look at, um, I think the most, well, I don't know if it's the most famous, but it's the one that I, I know the most about, the Justine Sacco uh, situation. So she fired this tweet off. It was a joke. She said, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding. I'm white, which I thought was fun. And, and she's really mocking white privilege in some sense, but people for whatever reason thought it was racist. And by the time, so she, she, I guess she was getting on a plane. By the time she landed, she was infamous. Just, you know, like so many people look at it, right? Exactly. Talk, talk about a life changing flight, right? <laughs> and she lost her job. And, you know, it must have been absolute torture for her. That, that can happen on Twitter. That really wouldn't happen in your community. Now, having said all of that, we must come to this confession, which is your community can also be much less tolerant precisely because there's less diversity and communities can be quite conformist. So, I mean, if you read about, well, I don't know if you like fiction, but if you read a Nathaniel Hawthorne, okay. <laughs> okay, so like Nathaniel Hawthorne is a great American writer. He wrote a lot about his Puritan heritage. So he's writing in the 1850s or so. And he, he wrote a lot about the intolerance of these communities. I mean, they're they're they just expect absolute deference to their worldview. And they were, in fact, much more brutally judgmental than we are now in many ways. Or, or the, And the same, I think, holds for, uh, say, small communities now versus New York City. I mean, New York City is so enormous and you're so anonymous that like the amount of judgment you're going to get for something is, is not much. Whereas if you live in a like near where I grew up, there were um, in Michigan, there were very conservative communities still, Calvinist communities that did not, they literally didn't serve alcohol, that you couldn't buy alcohol in the entire community. And 
they were quite judgmental. I'm not saying that's bad, by the way. I'm just saying that's the truth. So th that would have been, if you uh, participated in some kind of deviant behavior in that community and you were caught, it would probably be even worse than it would be a, 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 on, on social media today, let's say. So again, <laughs> it's weird because it's like both. That's a good point. Well, you bring up right there, I had a past guest, Rebecca Faith Lawson, and she mentioned that growing up in a small town is great, but one of the drawbacks of growing up in a small town, as opposed to, let's say, New York or something, is that it doesn't expand your mind the way it should, and you get maybe stuck in a group that's of a certain type, and then you, you don't grow beyond that. But it has a lot of the good qualities that the big town could never aim to have, like a calmness mm -hmm. and peaceful nature those things so there's so the, and and this this is a great point i mean i just think this is something that i i would emphasize you know you asked me this question earlier and then i i i became uh, excessively didactic about <laughs> intellectual honesty i should have said i i this just raises it or, or, or it it caused me to think that one of the principles I think is the most important to understand is trade-offs and how like, when you have one thing, you're often sacrificing something else that's also good. So it just makes me think about that with the small community. I, I grew up in a reasonably small um, town, I guess you would call it. I don't know if it's technically a city, but it was only like 9,000 people. And yes, you, you everybody kind of knows each other. You know people's kids, parents know each other. Uh, reputation is is more widespread. It's more important than it would be in a New York or a Boston or something. Uh, there's a kind of familiarity that is nice about that, uh, a hominess, a, a wistfulness, a nostalgia for this community. But also there are trade-offs because if if you were unfortunate enough to be, for, for one thing, as you said, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't challenge you. It doesn't expand your mind as much as your guest said, I'm sorry. But also, if you're unlucky enough to be uh, despised by your community, to violate your community's norms in such a way that everybody talks about you and you, your reputation is sullied, there's nowhere to go. Like that, I can't imagine what a horrifying feeling that would be. So like in, in Hawthorne, as I was talking about this writer, one of his novels is about a woman who commits adultery. And she's forced to, they embroider a, a scarlet A for adulteress on her, uh, on her clothes. And you, you can just imagine like how humiliating and mortifying that would be for a while. Now in, in, in the novel, she's like this sort of romantic, quasi tragic, but triumphant figure who, you know, rises against that, if you will. But in the beginning, she, I think they put her on a, it's been a while since I've read it, but I think they put her essentially on a scaffold to shame her in front of the community. Like, can you imagine this? You, you committed this, like, yeah, adultery is bad. You don't want to do it, right? Although there were quite extenuating circumstances in her case, but let's pretend there's not. You commit, you, you commit, a, <laughs> you wrong your wife and maybe you could even say people in the community by uh, engaging in adultery. Can you imagine being put on a scaffold in front of everybody in your community and just people yelling at you, whore, slut, house, house wrecker, what? Are, yeah, exactly. Like, just how mortifying that would be. And we, we would think that was barbaric now. We'd be like, oh my God. So like, that is a trade-off with small towns. I, I, I get it. I, People wax eloquent <laughs> about, oh, the glory of small towns and like community is so important and it is, but there is a trade-off. And I think we need to be honest about that. There's a reason many people are attracted to these big cities because you get away from that and you can find weird people doing weird things and people don't judge you for it. This is very true on that one in regards to me because I like to be very social in public large town like Los Angeles where I'm in is very mm. good because there's no shortage of people and people and people and people and I'm, I'm almost running out of people and there's millions so if I was in a small town I I would have run out in like a day you are like the exact opposite of me <laughs> we flip in that category yeah I want to stay home and avoid people and therefore I like a small town I get into a big city and I'm just like oh, it's just it, 
it, it's anxiety inducing and horrifying to me but i'm glad see this is the this is the uh, sort of benefit of pluralism you, you can move to a big city and scratch that itch as it were and enjoy that and i get to live in a small town and enjoy that as well this is true even if i go to a large group of uh, individuals i usually seek out like a few on the outside, it mm. tends to be the case because the chance of me connecting with the general large group is really low. Right, usually. that's true, yeah. On the point you had brought up earlier about how it's just a little piece of you that's seen on Twitter and that's commented, what are your thoughts on that dynamic where there's a hundred per- you're a 100% person? I used to make this comment. Right. That nobody, nobody that went big on YouTube or all those things over the years is live streaming their whole week Right. All day long, all their text messages, every thought they're having and every person they're interacting with. Nobody did that because um, then there would be other parts that weren't the cool parts and that that would mess up the whole story. And so when you were saying that about, let's say on Twitter, you showcase uh, 0.5% of your thoughts or something. Right. That's all people see. And you build up a reputation connected to that. Yes. And then if it's attacked, it's... 0.5% 0.5% of you is being attacked. Yeah. But then you may attach to it in some way. Is that a healthy dynamic? Do you, does it require compartmentalization? Yeah, I think thing? I think I think that's a good point. It's compartmentalization because I don't I, on the one hand I don't want to lament that because I think it's cool that you can yeah, I, I'm a private person. I don't I don't really want to um divulge details about my life if I don't have to and I don't want people talking about I mean I understand people will but I don't I don't like that per se so I'm glad that you can just present this very small facet of yourself which would be like your public self your opinions and whatnot on the other hand you're right it is it is important to recognize when you get angry with somebody Um, This doesn't really happen to me because I don't care so much, but clearly people get angry about opinions. But you recognize that this is 0.1% of that person, right? That person might be one of the nicest people you would ever meet. They might be helping people in their community, right? They might be going to Habitat for Humanity, giving out meals to people who need them, etc. And because they have a view that, you know... uh, Woody Allen was a terrible director. You're like, oh, I hate that person. Such a pain on there, you know. Like, or they like they they embrace AI, and you're like, what an idiot. <laughs> yeah, and I do. I think it. While that can be good because it allows people to participate uh, with a, with a public interface, as it were. It it is important to keep in mind that you shouldn't take it too seriously or get too worked up about it because you don't know these people. And bad opinions are not a whole person. A person is not composed only of his or her opinions. A person is composed of all kinds of things, moral deeds and character, etc., that are probably far more important than their opinions. This is a good one here. Earlier, we talked about compatibilism as related to free mm. will and determinism. Mm-hmm. But what are your thoughts on compatibility as far as the people we end up mm. connecting with on a at least medium to the long term? Mm-hmm. From your existence or people you've looked at, how important is it that the people you are like, you flow with have some real large characteristics that are uh, important that you share Mm -hmm. is that a key so it is for me i should say because i am so interested in debate and discourse that i cannot shut up and if you want to be friends with me you have to debate and talk about things too (laughs) there's just no way i i have i should say i have like one best friend who is not, he's, he's smart and he's an interesting guy, but he's not an intellectual, but we, we have, you know, we've been friends since elementary school. So we have all this built up time together that is irreplaceable. Other than that though, all of the people I talk to are interested in intellectual topics and willing to engage in debate. 
And even if we don't agree, we we have fun debating. So uh, compatibility is quite important because you have to be able to have a debate and understand each other in such a way that you can disagree, sometimes vehemently and vigorously, without offending each other. That that is crucial for me. Now I I, I say that I'm I'm sure I'm unique in that I'm not not thinking zero percent of the day, except for maybe if I'm even even when I'm not, I'm fully engaged in a movie or something. So like the life of the mind is just crucially important for me. And I just don't have uh, p- people with whom I'm friendly who don't share that interest. Uh, if I could, I imagine that for a lot of people, like if I played, let's say you played softball or something, you know, Okay, well then, is compatibility so important? It might not be. It might be you both like softball, so you can play softball together. And then after that, you drink a beer and you go home. No, you know, like, cool. Then it's probably not as crucial that you're compatible in various ways because you're not relating in those ways or they're not, they're not as important. So my own uh, view of compatibility is it's probably like, way more important for me than it is for a lot of people. No, I'm not. I'm sure there are other people who feel this way and who like just to debate things all day long. And for them, compatibility is probably important too. But I would say something I've thought about a lot is, um, well, okay, so there's this, you know, sometimes it's good to be forced to have relationships that you would not have chosen. And that's one of the things that I I miss about working at like an ordinary store. Like I grew up and I worked at a grocery store and I was friends with a lot of people there uh, whom I would not have been friends with otherwise. Right. You know, like I I don't we had the we had the concept of class friends, like the friends you were, you know, you you would talk to them in class and then you'd leave class and you never talked. (laughs) And it's kind of weird on the one hand. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. See you. Okay. See you tomorrow at one thirty or whatever your class was. And it's kind of weird on the one hand, but on the other hand, it actually makes a lot of sense. And there is something, you know, there's something beautiful, in fact, about this, like work friends. I, I was talking to my wife about this and I was just like, you know, I kind of miss having like these these ordinary work friends who who bring a completely different aspect of the world to you. You know, they they care about things you would never care about. And you you talk about things that like you would never talk about with other people. And I don't know if that's compatible, incompatible. It's it's just like you're forced to be friends with them. And we're, it sounds like you're more social than I am, but we're a social species. So like if you throw us into a room and you say, you're going to arrange boxes for eight hours with this other person, you're going to talk to the person, right? Unless the person is incredibly unlikable you'll figure out some way to relate to the person. So in that sense, it's almost like you don't have to be that compatible. And there's something enhancing about that. This is a good point you bring up. It's sort of like the best way to do it is you have really close individuals to you that share the main things that really match up with you. And then you also have yes. acquaintances or others around right. that bring you some variety that you don't bring to the table. I think that's exactly right. A good way of putting it is like, it's it's kind of cool to have like a few of those work friends. Like you're not going to call them on Friday, but if you're at work on a Tuesday, you're like, hey, what's up? You know? My last question for you today, what is the moment that we are currently in as a society and what what can be good in the upcoming few years? That is a a, a portentous question, isn't it? What is the moment? <laughs> what Huge. is the moment? I think it very much depends on who you are, <laughs> because I am old enough not to care anymore, <laughs> and I consider myself a connoisseur of art for art's sake and an art an an aesthetic dandy decadent. And I'm just like, you know what? (laughs) The society can go to hell. I'm going to enjoy art while it happens. (laughs) But let me answer somewhat more seriously. Not that that wasn't serious because it actually is a bit true for me. But 
Yeah, I, I mean, I actually, it, it seems to me we're on the precipice of AI, maybe even godlike AI quite soon, but, but certainly transformative AI, it seems to me for the next 10, 20 years, that's going to be the biggest story. I can't imagine that it's not and how that transforms our lives. I'm very pessimistic about that, as I have said. I even have what I call the Amish 2022 plan. I don't know if you're familiar with the Amish, but they live in communities with minimal technology. I, my, my plan is to stop technology at 2022 and live in a community in Texas or Idaho. And that that's my contingency plan if I don't like AI. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, 2022? Yeah, that would be, we stopped technology in 2022. So any technology oh, oh, that I came see. after 2022, we eschew. But there's an optimistic scenario in which, you know what, uh, we think this is going to be terrible. And yes, it's going to, call, uh, it's going to uh, compel adjustment, but it will actually eliminate so many tedious jobs, editing, uh, like all of these paperwork jobs that we still have that are tedious, it will dramatically improve efficiency and productivity. Maybe AI will cure cancer or do all of these wonderful things that we can't even fathom right now. And it will be a world of plenty in which we can relate to each other on the most primitive level, like about the things that we actually care the most about. And we, we don't have to worry about all of these other things. I guess what you called illusions or whatever. whatever. Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but these layers of, of superficial concerns or these masks that we wear or whatever. That would be the optimistic scenario, I suppose. And like, prognostication is obviously difficult. So I don't even want to prognosticate because like if you had asked me two years ago, my attitude, it would have been so different between, uh, uh, I don't know exactly when chat GPT four came out, but like the day before it came out and two weeks later, my view changed a lot. Cause I was like, wow, I did not know it would be capable of this. <laughs> right. So like, I can only imagine, you know, maybe an AI will be like, like, this is the thought I had, like, what if you have this AI interface and you type in, I want a noir movie, film noir movie, detective movie, let's say, with a quirky, intelligent lead detective and a wonderful buxom blonde as the characters. And it just says, okay, it takes two minutes and it generates a movie for you immediately <laughs> like well two minutes and then it generates the movie for you is that a good world or a bad world i don't know the answer to that but i think people who are in their 20s now will find out the answer to that because i think we'll have that before the next 30 years so so how we deal with that and what that means for us will answer your question I won't because I don't, <laughs> prognostication is hard. I, I'm personally pessimistic about it. But of course, people have been pessimistic about technology for all of history. And it's often worked out better for humans. So this may be no exception. That's a great point. Just to add on to that one, I think that the movie was not necessary in the first place, the two hour movie. So replacing it into a thing that's created and then replacing it later into a thing that's just automatically neuralinked or such. Ah, yeah, getting those steps. I, I see what you're saying. So you're saying like, just get right into whatever the thing was. That I mean, as somebody feeling. who is enthralled with film, I, I hope that you're wrong. Cause I can't imagine a world without it, but maybe, maybe the world in which this is just plugged right in. I would actually find more enjoyable. Who knows? <laughs> That's a classic one. <laughs> we can't predict all. Bo, I would like to thank you for having joined on yeah, this absolutely. discussion about a variety of topics on the program. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Glad to. And we are out.